I'd like to uh, thank the organizers of this conference, um, who have, of course, already been thanked by others. Uh, it's really, uh, I've been looking forward to sharing the first fruits of this research project for quite a while, the last year or so since I started working on it. And uh, what better place to do that uh, than Gainesville, Florida? Just uh, two nights ago, I was leafing through an issue of the Presse that was laid out on, uh, in the Price Library of Judaica. And Eureka, I found an article that I need to have. So uh, there will be more. This, this will never end. Uh, <laughs> So the impetus for this project comes from an article that I read in connection with a different research project, a related one, uh, about 20 years ago. The article was by Rabbi Sabatai Jayan, who was the chief rabbi of the uh, Sephardic community of uh, Argentina. Uh, the article was published in Mundo Israelita in 1930. And uh, in the article, among other things, he describes his experience, his disappointment, while attending a magnificent performance of August Strindberg's play The Father at the Teatro Excelsior uh, in Yiddish, uh, that uh, the audience, that, that it was a very sparsely attended performance. He wrote in that uh, article in 1930, I have seen the, the high priests of the Temple of Thalia perform the, the role of the father in Strindberg's play, but Sam Goldenberg surpasses them all. And that explains the slight change in title for my presentation, although the topic remains identical to the one that, would, that I uh, sent to the organizers. So the Yiddish theater was a quintessentially transnational enterprise with actors wandering from city to city and across boundaries and oceans from one country to another. In her recent book, Yiddish Empire, Deborah Kaplan provides a case study of the metamorphoses of one transnational constellation, the Vilna Troupe. The Yiddish theater in Argentina represents another facet of transnationalism. It served as a node in an international network comprising locally based theater owners, impresarios, actors, musicians, and crews, plus the guest stars and directors from abroad. The Yiddish theater also functioned within the diverse multilingual theater scene of Argentina's federal capital, but that's a topic that merits a separate discussion. The Wandering Stars brought with them scripts of original and translated plays, stage instructions, costumes, sets, and sometimes even stage equipment. Shmuel Iris' verses express the resentment that he and many of the Yiddish actors of Buenos Aires felt toward many of these guests. His misgivings were echoed by Argentina's Yiddish, leading Yiddish critics. During 1940, about half a dozen Yiddish stars, sorry, I have to keep my own time here. About half a dozen uh, Yiddish stars visited Argentina where they performed with the two professional troops that were active that year. Among the guests were two of New York's most prominent dramatic actors, Samuel Goldenberg on the right and Roy Schwartz on the left. Goldenberg was familiar to old timers, having performed in Argentina in 1913 and continuously from 1914 to 1916. The impresario Isaac Nuger invited him to leave the Teatro Excelsior Company for four and a half months in 1930, and he was joined there for eight weeks by Stella Adler from one of New York's preeminent Yiddish theatrical families. Maurice Schwartz, founder and director of New York's Yiddish Art Theater, uh, performed for two and a half months at the Teatro Nuevo and the Teatro Argentino at the invitation of Adolf Mide. This was the first of many South American tours that Schwartz would undertake. The Excelsior Company, with its cohesive cohort of experienced actors who performed together over eight months during the 1930 season, was considered the better of the two troops. The classical composer Janke Ficher, or Jacobo Fischer, 
bolstered the Excelsior stature as that company's orchestral conductor. Goldenberg and Schwartz carved out two very carved out very distinctive artistic profiles. Schwartz is still remembered for his classic film performances in the roles of Uncle Moses and Tevye. Goldenberg was that rarity on the Yiddish stage, a romantic drawing room actor, craggily handsome, elegant and debonair, with clear diction and graceful movement, and a weakness for playing the piano on stage. Unfortunately, his only film, Shir Bashirin, is lost. In early June 1930, a few days before his arrival, Goldenberg telegraphed his greetings from Rio de Janeiro in an advertisement that ran in the Yiddish at Zeitung, one of two uh, Yiddish dailies in Buenos Aires. He announced that he looked forward to staging Jud Zeus, a, a dramatic adaptation of a novel by Leon Feuchtwanger about the 18th century German financier and court Jew, Josef Zeus Oppenheimer. The play had premiered at the Yiddish Art Theater in New York 10 months earlier under Maurice Schwartz's direction, with Goldenberg and Schwartz alternating the two leading roles of Jutzus and Duke Karl Alexander of Württemberg, and that is Goldenberg in the middle. Schwartz arrived in Buenos Aires. Schwartz arrived in Buenos Aires in mid-June, and before the Excelsior production was ready, he promptly staged Jutzus at the Teatro Nuevo. Buenos Aires audiences would thus be treated to two different productions of that play within the space of 10 days. Goldenberg's and Schwartz's tours took place at a historical conjuncture in the development of the Yiddish theater in Argentina, though that might not have been readily apparent to the actors or their audiences. The Yiddish theater, internationally, was in the grips of a crisis facing a multi-pronged array of challenges, especially involving economics, linguistic assimilation, and repertory. As the worldwide economic depression was deepening, Buenos Aires served as a test bed for the long-standing art versus Schund debate, Schund being the low-brow, trashy repertory, or at least as so defined by the critics. And this was a uh, debate that had distinctly local and regional characteristics. The Argentine Jewish theater critics assessed these two actors' contrasting repertories, with Goldenberg presenting many plays associated with Schund or Lobra repertory, and Schwartz personifying more elevated literary aspirations. A close reading of the Yiddish and Spanish language Jewish press from 1930 also reveals striking evidence of the often bitter rivalries between the actors, their impresarios, and the critics. In venues other than New York City, Yiddish dramas and, uh, and melodramas customarily had runs of a week at most, whereas operettas enjoyed longer runs if they were box office hits. And because both Schwartz and Goldenberg were dramatic actors, their Buenos Aires audiences experienced a frequent turnover of plays uh, in 1930, and the two Yiddish companies were in rehearsal from 12 to 14 hours each day. During his 18 weeks in Buenos Aires, Goldenberg put on 19 plays at the Teatro Excelsior. Stella Adler um, received equal billing Continue with that. Stella Adler received equal billing with Goldenberg as his co-star in several productions. For his part, Schwartz mounted 13 productions during his 10-week tour. Six of Schwartz's plays were works by prominent Yiddish literary authors: Shalom Aleichem, Shalom Ash, Peretz Hirschbein, and Yoyner Rosenfeld. In addition, he mounted Abraham Goldfaden's comic operetta, The Two Kumi Lemels, which had been memorably revived a few years earlier at the Yiddish Art Theater in New York. Each actor also put on plays by modern European authors, including Tolstoy, Gorky, Ibsen, and Strindberg. The overwhelming majority of the original Yiddish plays that Goldenberg staged were melodramas, only one of which was by an author, Solomon Lieben, with even modest literary pretensions. 
Most of the others were by contemporaneous New York playwrights, now virtually forgotten or totally forgotten, such as Harry Kalmanovitz, Moses Richter, and William Siegel. Anyone hear of those Yiddish writers? They were very popular in the 1920s. And three works by an earlier author, Isidore Zola Tureski. I'll return to that in a bit. Goldenberg also staged a couple of light comedies and one operetta, which is Shir Hashirn in this poster. The one oddball play that Goldenberg produced in Buenos Aires was the adults only, gender bending, yes a man, not a man, or appearance of a man, with Goldenberg playing a character of ambiguous sexual identity in an unconsummatable marriage with his former secretary, played by Stella Adler. Yiddish plays by Latin American authors were few enough to begin with. They were produced infrequently, usually as one-off performances, and they were almost never put on by star actors visiting from abroad. Argentina is missing from the Argentine Yiddish theater, is how Shmuel Rochansky, the critic for the Yiddish Zeitung, put it. Toward the end of his run, however, Goldenberg premiered the play Zizia Goy by the Argentine-born Yiddish author Shmuel Glazerman. Its plot is prototypically melodramatic. Zizia is a thoroughly creolized, a creole in Argentine Yiddish, Jewish gaucho in an art agricultural colony on the Pampas. He marries off his daughter to a city slicker who promptly cheats on his bride and swindles his father-in-law out of his property. The familiar Argentine setting and the dialogue peppered with Spanish and Spanish-inflected Yiddish made this the hit play of the Excelsior season. Although Zizia Goy had just four performances under Goldenberg's direction, the Excelsior troupe, minus Goldenberg, took it on tour once the regular season ended, and it then joined the Argentine Yiddish repertory. For decades, the Jewish underworld had exercised an outsized influence on the Argentine Jewish Yiddish theater and its repertory. The determined crusade against Schun coincided with a feverish campaign in Argentina and elsewhere in South America to clamp down on the Tumayan, the impure pimps and prostitutes, and also expel them from the theaters. The controversy over the 1926 production of late Malach's sens sensationalizing play Iberbus, Overflow or Regeneration, was a defining moment in the ongoing struggle against the Tumayan in the Yiddish theaters of Argentina. The coup de grace came in late uh, September 1930, three weeks after a right-wing military coup and in the thick of the Excelsior uh, season, with the government's crackdown on the Organization of Jewish Sex Traffickers, the Sociedad Stimical, following months of uh, well-publicized raids on houses of ill repute, including the Migdal's headquarters. These developments underscore why both Schwartz and Goldenberg felt compelled to put on plays that address prostitution and the sex trade. Schwartz repeatedly staged Cholomash's notorious drama, God of Vengeance, in late June 1930, at the end of July, and again in late August. God of Vengeance portrays the ultimately unsuccessful attempts by a Warsaw brothel owner to protect his daughter from the family's enterprise and its underworld milieu. Goldenberg, for his part, put on two lurid melodramas in A Web of Sin by William Siegel and The White Slave by Isidore Zolotoreski. Siegel's pot boiler was a contemporary play. Zolotoreski's shop-worn melodrama had its premiere fully two decades earlier. Both productions starred Stella Adler in the role of the victimized prostitute. For the Yiddish theater in Argentina, discussions concerning literary and artistic values proceeded within the context of the struggle against the corrosive influences of the Tumayan. The critics considered the better repertory to be a more decent alternative to the cliché and vulgar melodramas and operettas that were so popular among the Yiddish theater audiences everywhere, including Argentina. Respectable community standards needed to be enforced at the theater. 
In the view of Yankir Botoshansky of the Festa, expulsion of the Timaeum from the Yiddish theaters of Buenos Aires was a precondition for the elevation of the repertory. His counterpart at the Yiddish Zeitung, Rojansky, argued that the campaign for the better repertory operated on a parallel track with the community's fight against the traffickers. It reflected, it reflected a generational conflict between the very first Jews, in quotes, the Tumeim, and the newer immigrants, with social and political ramifications that, in Rojansky's view, happened also to be played out at the theater. The two newspaper critics exchanged vitriolic polemics about over these nuances, and there was something to be said in favor of both viewpoints. During the 1930 theater season, everyday conversations on the street and in the cafes were frequently dominated by impressions of performances and comparisons between rival players acting. The three Jewish newspapers in Buenos Aires spilled a considerable, considerable amount of ink on reviews of Yiddish plays and background articles about the guest stars. Personality clashes, business interests, and disagreements over the theatrical repertory all play their parts in the newspaper's coverage, or lack thereof, of the guest stars. In his year-end survey of theatrical developments in 1930, Botoshansky alluded to an unspecified clash that had occurred between Goldenberg, together with his impresario Nuger, and Di Cressa. In Goldenberg's, quoting, Rojansky, uh, quoting Botoshansky, quoting Goldenberg's unjustified pretensions led to the point that Di Cressa was compelled to engage in a passive conflict with the Excelsior, which would indirectly dictate what kind and how many reviews to write about both North American guests, meaning Schwartz and Goldenberg. Whatever the precise nature of that dispute, in mid-July 1930, the Teatro Excelsior banned Botoshansky and his colleague, uh, Dr. Elzhitnitsky, for the duration of the season and pulled all of its ads from the press. Thereafter, reviews of Goldenberg's production ceased to appear in that, in that newspaper. In fact, his name was almost not mentioned at all unless it was impossible to avoid it. In their stead, the press's critics published dense analyses of Alexander Tairo's theories of the modern theater, and they reviewed production and after production the Tairo's avant-garde comedy theater on tour from Moscow was putting on in Russian at the Teatro Odeon. Meanwhile, readers of the press must have been puzzled by the news blackout in their newspaper over a period of three and a half months concerning Yiddish productions at the Teatro Excelsior. Five days after Goldenberg's official uh, farewell performances, the press finally ended its silence concerning, concerning his season at that theater. What? What? So, a reader had written in to ask, should we combat the Schoen theater in general or the persons in it? Dr. Zhitnitsky vehemently responded, the Schoen theater must be combat combated per se, along with the persons who are its advocates and its instigators. Goldenberg, he conceded, was a gifted and tremendously talented actor who, however, for many years went along the malign path of melodrama, operetta, and vulgarity, having redeemed himself by performing alongside Schwartz at the Yiddish Art Theater in New York in its 1929 production of Youth Zeus, Goldenberg's relapse into Schoen during his Buenos Aires tour amount, amounted to an unpardonable artistic betrayal. Zhitnitsky wrote, and that requires every critic who values the theater as a basis of culture to combat the Goldenberg phenomenon in the Yiddish theater. I'll briefly skip over a bit, uh, only to mention that Mundo Israelita, for its part, uh, reviewed none of Schwartz's productions and dismissed him as a uh, poser and an avaricious uh, adventurer because he showed up in Buenos Aires performing for an inferior <coughs> troupe with, and, and was there as a star with his own troupe back in New York, uh, left behind. So, um, and in 1933, uh, uh, Botoshansky wrote a survey of the Yiddish theater in the Warsaw Journal, 
uh, Luther Erschick Lutzer, uh, in which he uh, provided a capsule history of the Yiddish in Argentina and mentioned some of the uh, guest actors they visited in recent years, and also some of the Yiddish actors who resi resided permanently in that country, most prominently his wife, Marion Lehrer. So, in 1930, uh, Zhitnitsky, in one of his crit uh, crit articles, offered this prescription for the Argentine Yiddish stage. Abolition of the star system, gathering good and original plays, introducing the institution of good directing and directors into the Yiddish theater, along with ensemble performance, these are the means that will restore the Yiddish theater to health. While the pimps and prostitutes were indeed banished from the Yiddish theaters of Buenos Aires after 1930, and I'm approaching my conclusion here, the guest stars were not. And yet the expulsion of the Tumayan arguably helped to create safe spaces for the tours beginning in the early 1930s of Schwartz, Jacob Benami, Joseph Uloff, and Luba Kadison. These <coughs> fossils of the literary repertory found devoted audiences during their many repeat visits to Argentina. Their, their success also reflected the growing sophistication of the Argentine Yiddish audiences. But operetta stars, including the young prima donna Miriam Cresson, the charismatic Molly Pecan, and the risque Nelly Kosman also traveled to Buenos Aires in those years. As much as Yiddish crit as much as critics might inveigh against guests, 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 without them the professional theater was unable to flourish in Argentina. And yet, both by positive and negative example, the guest stars also helped to spur the local activists to pursue their own non-commercial commercial theatrical experiments, leading to the, the leading to the success of the Yiddish folks theater, Teatro Kif, later in that decade. <laughs> the 1930 uh, Yiddish theater season in Buenos Aires offered operettas, com comedies, dramas, dramas originally written in Yiddish, dramas from world, from world literature, curiosities of dramatic literature, and melodramas, lots of melodramas, including one by an Argentine Yiddish author. Two major stars of the New York Yiddish stage descend descended upon Argentina that year, together with an actress who cut her teeth on Yiddish melodramas and would later achieve fame as one of North America's most influential teachers of acting. If Maurice Schwartz stood for the best of the classic Yiddish literary repertory, then Samuel Goldenberg represented the most capable exponent of the so-called Schoen repertory. These two actors personified the split personality of the Yiddish theater. In that single season, when the Zeiners provided a, an ideal laboratory for them to display their talents and take their lumps as they performed their chosen plays. Thank you.